Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9. Uh, good night. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing. Welcome, everybody, tonight. Hey, MH370X, hopefully everybody's doing well tonight. Um, hello, Beninator. Hello, Amanda. Hello, we Rona, Mystical Wonderland, His Highness, uh, Langegi. I always forgot how to say your name. Uh, Joe, how's it going? T-Bass, Jack Trading, JL. Yeah, and Salty Decimator. Re Welcome. Okay. So, uh, real quick, uh, this stream is going to be a little bit different. We're going to play this video. There's several videos that we're going to go through the next couple days related to Thomas Bearden. And this is the first one. Turn on the volume. Where he talks about scalar physics and the idea of weather manipulation. It's a really interesting one. It's about an hour long. We're going to dig into it. Uh, I will commentate at certain points. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that without further ado, we're going to jump right on in. And I'm going to end up full screening this as well. Uh, so I will, you're not going to see the chat for most of this until I, I switch over the, the view as well. So here we go. Oh, so real quick, Thomas Bearden is a lieutenant colonel who uh, was a scientist, an engineer, I believe. And he, this video is from 1985. So scalar physics goes way back, 40 years. Uh, really interesting science, very consistent with the stuff that we've been pushing out there. I hope you guys enjoy this video. There's a couple more that we'll look at in the next few days here. Subject for this evening is Soviet weather engineering over North America, which they have been doing since the beginning of 1966-1967. That was the first shot, our attempt at influencing the weather directly over the United States. They then lapsed into a lot of not influencing it for a period of years, and in 1983, particularly, really opened up the big guns after having energized the infamous woodpecker signals, the so-called over the horizon radars in the communication band in the mid-1970s. Real quick, I'm going to pull the chat over to the right so I can read you guys' comments while we're watching. So if you guys have any information related to this that you would like to share, uh, where's my video cam? that you think is relevant, feel free to post it in the chat. I will bring it up as we're going through this. Uh, welcome to people who are just joining here as well. If you've already seen this, this is a video that was posted out there uh, a few days ago, but it's, it's, I think it's been on the internet for a while. I'm not sure exactly when it appeared. And we're going to just play it in its entirety for the most part. As you just saw from that introduction, uh, the basis for the video is the idea that the uh, Soviets, uh, the Russians, so to speak, can uh, manipulate weather through electromagnetic effects. Um, I think that when we've been looking at stuff recently, uh, this would be like why we're potentially looking at the ionosphere. One thing that was posted today that is relevant to this as well is this idea that 
uh, where this uh, eclipse that's coming up, that's supposedly like this eclipse is coming up. I think NASA is sending some jets out into or some rockets into space or into the atmosphere. And supposedly they're going to be measuring like the effects of the eclipse. Pretty weird stuff, guys. OK, here we go. The first thing I'm going to have to tell you is that there are three kinds of electromagnetics and only one is being used today in the Western world. The first kind is the kind we all study as electrical engineers and even us nuclear engineers study a little bit of it. And it's classical electromagnetics. The foundations of that go back before the Civil War. It's quite old and there are serious flaws and many errors in it as is quite well known in a few circles. The second kind, uh, first of all, let me characterize the first kind of electromagnetics. Everything is due to the force fields, the so-called electric field, magnetic field. If that reduces to zero in an area, you don't have any more electromagnetics going on in there. The potentials themselves are considered to be mathematical figments. Now I'm going to be giving you a little background. I'm going real fast through it, but you'll need this to understand what I'm talking about in the weather engineering and understand it. So please bear with me during the first part. We're going to have a little uh, quick sledding. The second kind of electromagnetics came from quantum mechanics and it's exactly opposed. The primary and real things are the potentials and the force fields, so-called, are totally derived by differentiating operations. So you see a flip-flop of 180 degrees about how the two approaches regard electromagnetics. Further, in quantum mechanics, when the electric field and the magnetic field reduce to zero in an area, you still may have the potentials. And if these potentials, which are the real things going on, interfere with each other, you can have real effects still produce in, in charged particle systems, real physical systems. As a matter of fact, in 1959, a classic paper by Aronoff and Baum in Physical Review pointed this out very strongly. And since then, part of that has come to be called the Baum-Aronoff effect, or sometimes the Aronoff-Baum effect. It had been in physics 30 years at that point, uh, pointed out by Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, and ignored. It has continued to be ignored in the nearly 30 years since 1959 when it was strongly pointed out by Baum and Aronoff. What we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, is if we can make this effect exist in the big world, they think it, effect, it exists only in the micro world, we can get action at a distance, that's no longer a dirty word, and we can get action even when there's no ordinary electromagnetics going on. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And in the process, I'm going to show you how to change the mass and inertia of an object, affect its rate of flow through time. Guys, holy smokes. Do you guys just hear what he just said? Ehrenhoff bomb effect, Feynman, Mentioned that we can uh, manipulate the potential there. Wait, wait so I'm going to go back to that real quick, guys. Just I want to I listen to this one more time. It has continued to be ignored in the nearly 30 years since 1959 when it was strongly pointed out by Baum and Aronoff. What we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, is if we can make this effect exist in the big world, they think it, effect, it exists only in the micro world, we can get action at a distance, that's Oops. no longer a dirty word, and we can get action even when there's no ordinary electromagnetics going on. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Action and in the at process, a distance. I'm going to show you. Action at a distance and inertial mass reduction. Guys, I mean, that's a bingo. You how to change the mass and inertia of an object, affect its rate of flow through time, affect the gravitational field, and so forth affect the gravitational field and so forth. So surprised we didn't look at Thomas Bearden earlier. The science goes back at least several decades at this point now. Um, obviously, it's been known out there. The question is how far advanced have we come with this information? Here we go. Now, the third kind of electromagnetics is the mechanism by means of which you do those things. In other words, you reduce the ordinary electromagnetics to zero, the electric field and the magnetic field, deliberately. 
You then, you do this by making a zero system. You oppose the vectors so that they sum to zero, but they are still there in the substructure. Hey, when we studied electromagnetics, they forgot to tell us that a zero vector was not nothing. It can be a system of very active forces, each of which is time varying, and yet the system will not be detectable by any ordinary instrument. It turned out that the unorthodox scientific community in the United States had been using this for some years, but not expressing it quite that succinctly. For example, the hook. Okay, so what he's saying here is that we can zero out the vector. Now, why is this important? Because this speaks to Maxwell's equations, the B field equation for Maxwell. So the B field equation times the del cross operator academia would tell you it equals zero because it's unmeasurable this is what he's saying he's saying that it's not nothing when you do that if you change the b the b field equation times the del cross operator from zero equals to a now you have the capability to do exactly what thomas bearden is mentioning thomas bearden i believe was the real deal everything he's going to be saying in this video is consistent with the stuff that we have been investigating um this means that we can manipulate gravity in short so let's learn how to do it from him right now Hooper patterns. What we are saying now is that if we do this, if we make deliberate zeros, but we make them with vectors which are still there and active, we have a new kind of electromagnetics, a third kind. And I have dubbed that scalar electromagnetics, and I hope the name, the reason for the name will become clear a little later. I won't bother to read that thing. We simply have a zero vector envelope, but it's the substructure that we have placed within a zero that is fantastic. In terms of modern physics, we have reached into the virtual world what happens before physical change occurs, and we now can deliberately engineer it. Let me say that again in case it went by you. With this simple mechanism, with few coils and transistors and so forth, by making deliberate zeros, we can deliberately engineer the Schrodinger equation, and we can deliberately affect the probabilities of quantum mechanics. The hidden variable theory now becomes directly engineerable. In we can deliberately engineer quantum mechanics and Schrodinger's equations and the probabilities. What does that sound like to you, chat? To me, that sounds like the double slit experiment. To me, this sounds like rebuilding the wave function. Now, as we listen to this, uh, you guys have been following along for a while. Keep in mind all the scientists and engineers that we've been talking to. Think about the MH370 investigation, the things that I've brought up related to the double slit experiments to uh, the wave function rebuilding from the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. Everything is starting to come together. This is the reason why the scientists and engineers have wanted to talk to us is because I had sit, sat out there and said, we need to understand quantum mechanics. We need to understand ER equals EPR, the idea of what a wormhole really means, bending gravity, superconductivity, and AI. All the implications of what I have said. What had been statistical before now becomes at least partly deterministic. I'm going to jump now a whole bunch of years. In 1921, at the instigation or recommendation of Albert Einstein, a man by the name of Colusa succeeded, uh, published a paper where he had successfully united electrical field and gravitational field in a common unified theory. 1921. To do that, he had to add another physical dimension. And a very strange thing emerged. Chat, he added another physical dimension. <laughs> Guys, what have I been saying on every podcast? Adding another dimension. Space is not empty. We can manipulate gravity. All of this goes back to 1921 is when the first unification theory could have potentially already been out there. I think the unification theory has been solved multiple times. This could be over 100 years old. Absolutely incredible. There's really only one field in nature if you're looking at that hyperspace. It is the five-dimensional gravitational field. And it intersects our world in two things. One thing we call the electromagnetic field, 
and the other thing we call the gravitational field in the general sense, general relativity, the ability to curve and warp and twist space-time itself. And by the way, the electromagnetics just turned out to be the fifth dimensional aspect of that. So we added one more space dimension, which we do not see. Klein, a few years later, explained what happened to that dimension. It's really rolled up around every little point in our space. Quite nice mathematically, and it's real, by the way. But the, the theory languished for many years until really about the early to mid-70s, when the new symmetries in the forefront of physics and particle physics began to see that with that type of geometry, you could get in all these weird particles and you could get in all the forces. You really could begin to approach a unified theory of all forces of nature. And the physicists became very excited. The modern theory, a variant of that theory, Calusa-Klein geometry, has 11 dimensions, 10 space, one time. All but the three ordinary space dimensions we see are considered to be rolled up in little circles around every point. But with that thing and supergravity, you can get in all of the particles and everything we know into physics in a single unified theory. And the physicists are excited. That's the hottest thing in physics. They just haven't discovered yet that it is directly engineerable in the simplest fashion you ever dreamed of. I'm going to give you a very simple thing now to let you understand what I'm talking about. This is schematic, so don't think of the thing as being spatially separated between the two little circles on the, on the plane. The plane represents our ordinary world. The hand represents an extra dimension, so it's that fifth dimensional uh, geometry that uh, Calusa came up with in 1921. The hand itself represents that fifth dimensional gravitational field which intersects our world in two fashions. One electromagnetic shown by the forefinger extended, that intersection, and the other by the thumb, which is our gravitational field, as we see it in the little intersections. And both of the intersections, by the way, at the same point. They are not spatially separated. Normally, we don't make vector zeros. Nobody ever trained us to do that in electromagnetics. There is not a single textbook, either physics or electromagnetics in the United States of America or in the Western world that dwells upon what you do when you deliberately make such vector zeros. I, I'm almost willing to state that probably not a single orthodox physicist has made such an experiment. If they are, it will be only one or two of them. But notice what we do if we deliberately zero the electromagnetic intersection, which is what we're doing when we make the zero. But we control what goes into the zero. We can put energy in there, or we can take the energy out. When we do that, it's coming in and out of the thumb as gravitational energy, directly as curvature of space-time. Now, what have we said? We have said that rigorously, with that simple mechanism, I can provide the direct conversion of electromagnetic energy into gravitational field energy, or vice versa. Now, if you want to do any gravity, gentlemen, there it is. And the unorthodox researchers have been doing anti-gravity a little bit in this country for a period of years, like levitating 65 pounds, like plywood, which is not magnetic field. So with a very simple thing and look. So right there, he mentioned um, zero point energy as well. So this is the idea that if you zero out the, the vector potentials, now you can put energy into it and take energy out of it. And if there's no vector potential for the electric and the magnetic fields, then you are tapping into the gravitational potential. That was huge. I had just now figured that out. So this is actually where for sure we are combining the vector, we are using the uh, scalar physics, which is the uh, electro and magnetic potentials to manipulate gravity. And this is where we are combining now with the zero point idea as well. So there are two things exactly as I was saying is that in order for this to be possible, we simply need an extra dimension and we need to understand that space is not empty in general.
Yeah. And real quick, uh, I have uh, I, I actually Florence the Changi just messaged me. So for DNI, yes, I know Florence, the French uh, author. She's uh, very intelligent. OK, let's keep going. Looking at it through modern eyes and adding that single thing, we can now use electromagnetics to make gravitational field energy in the general sense or vice versa. We can warp, engineer, and twist space-time at will, as we wish, in whatever pattern we wish. And it's been in the literature, if you cared to notice, since 1921. I won't dwell on this. I will simply state that all that a mass is anyway, a, a particle of mass, is in fact a trapped scalar resonance. I'm going to give you a quick once-over about scalar resonance, and we'll go on. Take a normal resonance system with a wave moving back and forth in a cavity so that it's in phase and coherent. Suppose that there were two waves moving along together, but the second wave, the electric and magnetic field were 180 out from the first one. That's a scalar resonance system. Your normal instrument won't even see it. We can build special detectors and have that will see it. That's all a mass is, but you can make a current of that kind of resonance, and you can pipe that current down a wire or you can add to that resonance in the system, or you can take it away. So I want to play that again. I don't. I hope. I don't know if he goes back to it, but he he mentioned resonance. So this part right here. Now I want you guys to think back to the paper that I posted by Dave Rossi, where he talked about oscillations and resonance that's required, and uh, having the the waves make love instead of making war and fighting. The difference between an explosion and these quantum effects that we see. I'm just going to go back right here as well to resonant cavity as well. Do you guys know what the resonant cavity reminds you of? Does anyone in the chat, what does the resonant cavity remind you of? Don't worry, I'm going to show you guys. What does the resonant... Oh, well, hello. The resonant cavities, doesn't this say... These are your resonant cavities right here. Coupled resonant cavities. Coherent matter wave beam by Lockheed Martin. That is a bingo, folks. That is a straight up bingo. This is a scalar wave, gravitational wave patent, essentially, that we're looking at here in the background. Lockheed Martin. Those are Lockheed Martin orbs. Lockheed Martin can manipulate gravity. This is 10 microns across that they have created the capability to, uh, to uh, manipulate gravity through scalar potential, through scalar physics, the world has no idea. It's right there, chat. Right there. Coupled resonant cavities. Cavity is resonant to either, to either the wave individually, wave and anti-wave, uh, superpose and move along together back and forth. But the second wave, the electric and magnetic field were 180 out from the first one. That's a scalar resonance system. And your normal instrument won't even see it. We can build special detectors and have that will see it. That's all a mass is, but you can make a current of that kind of resonance, and you can pipe that current down a wire, or you can add to that resonance in the system, or you can take it away. What did I say? I said you can pump the mass and inertia directly into an object and increase it, or you can pump it out of there. And if you pump all of it out of there, it'll dematerialize on you. And the th statements I am making are based in part on experimental evidence in the laboratory, private proprietary laboratory. Experimental evidence in the laboratory, chat. Experimental evidence. You know who else told us about experimental evidence in the laboratory? Dave Rossi when we went on Tim Pool. This has been figured out. This is in the laboratories. This is happening in Lockheed Martin Laboratories, probably also happening in Northrop Grumman, all of them. I mean, it's the same engineers that just go around. And yes, Yahtzee! This is better than bingo. You guys are correct. So that was, that's huge, guys. Here we go. Now, the scalar wave, that is the wave that has a zero resultant 
for the electric field and a zero resultant for the magnetic field, but it's composed of components which are waving and, and moving and communicating and everything else, is the universal wave in the universe, totally undiscovered as yet in Western science. But you can make it for 10 cents on the laboratory bench. You can convert a radar very simply to be a scalar radar, for example. These waves come from and go to the nucleus. They go right through the Faraday cage. They do not interact with the electrons unless you have the most extreme nonlinear situation you've ever heard of. They don't move electrons. And you can go right through any Faraday cage. You can go right through the Earth, for example, and you can go through the ocean with megahertz signals using these techniques. As we sit here talking, the Soviet Union is communicating worldwide uh, as of 10 days ago, they were communicating on well over 37 frequencies in their command and control systems for the large weapon systems they built for strategic weapons in this fashion. I have a personal friend that can deliver on the shelf the communication system, prototype already built and tested, that will prove that statement. And I challenge anybody in the United States outside of him at the present time to measure that communication system. These are nuclear waves. They communicate between nuclei. And if you put in that substructure the correct pattern, you can go in and transmute elements. In modern physics, to make a proton, a neutron, or vice versa, all you gotta do is flip one quark. And that is simply a pattern in the substructure. A man was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1977 for proving that biological systems transmute elements even though they only have millivolts and microvolts to use. And I bet you didn't even know that. So also, what did he just drop there? He also just dropped a connection to Bob Greenier right there. Low energy nuclear reactions, transmutation and alchemy. In terms of what Bob Greenier has been looking at into cold fusion and the thunderstorm generator, same exact idea that he just dropped. Uh, real quick, someone in the chat asked about um, Dan Winter. Uh, I think that Dan Winter certainly knows some some stuff. Uh, absolutely, a uh, very intelligent person. Uh, but uh, I try to avoid some of the esoteric uh, elements of stuff. And this is what I've said, guys. And this is just my personal opinion on stuff. I think you guys should listen to everybody who's out there. But uh, you know, we should, tr in my opinion, we should not try to connect everything together uh, because when we do that, we lose a lot of people out there. This is already enough for people to try to wrap their brains around. I think the idea of scalar physics is enough. The idea that we can manipulate gravity. Then we can work out uh, how everything in the whole universe is connected together. Armstrong, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Armstrong, thank you very much for the donation. Appreciate it. Critical hit. Love you. Here we go. His name was Curvon. Today he's dead. All the nuclei of the universe are in constant communication. Much of vacuum space-time is made up of these scalar waves between the nuclei throughout the universe. Another thing that came out of the general relativistic wave, these are general relativistic waves. Special relativity does not apply. We are always in a curved space-time when we're using them. Uh, part of the thing that came out of the theory is you are no longer confined to the speed of light at all. If you're clever, you can get almost any velocity you want to, whether it's slower in the speed of light or faster. A Tesla, for example. Okay, guys, he just said that we, every point in the universe is connected by scalar waves. He just said that we can go faster than the speed of light. Uh, what more do you really need? I mean, there's absolute proof right there. That the videos uh, and what we see is possible. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, it's the year 2024 right now, and that this was almost 40 years ago and no one took this seriously the, the the textbooks have been written in a way where people don't even know about it johnny party i'm sorry you're depressed hopefully this science will cheer you up here we go also i think he he's really explained the unification theory too of general relativity he said that this uh does not worry about special relativity it's just general relativity who was using these kinds of waves shortly after 1900 and keeping it a deep dark secret Tesla reported speeds of 50 times the speed of light. I have personally participated in an experiment which kicked out an electromagnetic wave of this type at eight times the speed of light. If you'll check the Russian literature, and I'll give you the references if you're interested, the speed of light is variable anyway. <clears throat> it's been known for 80 years 
by the astronomers that the speed of light in a hard vacuum on the surface of the Earth is a little faster than the speed of light in the deep space away from the charged particles. So these are nuclear waves. They are not electromagnetic waves that interact with the electron shells. They, electron, they interact with the nuclei and with the internal components of the proton and the neutron. Okay, my martini is ready to go. The speed of light is not a constant. He just said the speed of light is a variable that he experimentally uh, witnessed speeds uh, uh, eight times the speed of light. So why is that important? Because we have the permittivity of free space itself. So like Dave Rossi pointed out in Tim Pool, if you were to shoot a laser through this, vod this glass here of my martini, you're going to see a refraction of the light because the permittivity is going to change. Same thing is true of free space. Free space is not empty, remember? So the reason why it appears though the speed of light is constant is because we are only witnessing it as it goes through space all the time around us. We don't have anything else to compare it to. We can't compare it to the speed of light through the ether, for example. This is very similar to the concept of time dilation. Time dilation, it appears as though time moves fluidly and consistently and, and linearly because we're all on the sur surface of the earth. But when we go into outer space, we realize, oh no, time doesn't flow consistently. Similar idea to the idea of the speed of light. This is honestly another Yahtzee moment. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Yahtzee! Let's keep going. What I have the audacity to say to you is that we now have a tool that we do not have to talk about nuclear physics. We can go in there and engineer the nucleus. And transmutation is only one of the things that can be done. Transmuting elements. Again, the basis for this has been well established in the literature since 1921. With these waves, you see most of our ideas of the macro world are given to us by the ordinary photon interaction, which is almost always an interaction with the electron shells. This is a different order of reality. We're really dealing now in hyperspaces, at least 11 dimensions, and the world looks quite different indeed. And physical reality in this kind of physics looks quite different indeed from the ideas we have in our head from classical electromagnetics and classical physics and the normal macro world. Just as quantum mechanics was a drastic change to classical mechanics, this is an even further drastic macroscopically mass appears fluid and changeable who is the person in the chat that just mentioned the idea that uh really mass and matter is oscillations it's waves everything is waves um so yeah if we can manipulate mass if mass is fluid and changeable this is how you can have uh, macroscopic phase conjugation because if mass is just a wave now we can do the same thing that we would do to optical phase conjugation Essentially, we can create a hologram, but using actual mass, solid state objects. This is what Salvatore Pius was talking about when I asked him, can we manipulate and make a solid state object achieve, you know, a superconductive state, not just plasmas, not just light. Can we achieve uh, a coherent, um, a coherence amongst the uh, waveform? Very interesting change to quantum mechanics because it makes what had been statistical now deterministic and engineerable. I'm an engineer. I don't want to play statistics. I want to make models and I want to make the sucker work. The great cosmic engines of the universe do not operate with the residues of the differential operators making the force fields. That's the garbage that's thrown out. The great cosmic engines of the universe operate inside vector zero systems. That includes all the nuclei in the universe and everything inside them that modern physics has found out about. Okay, this kind of wave can be modeled as a longitudinal wave. I won't go into that whole treatment. I'll just say that uh, whereas you model a normal wave as a transverse wave, you model this one as a longitudinal wave. And indeed, when you interfere this wave, you break up the coherence of the substructure. They now no longer sum to zero, and guess what that gives you? It gives you a non-zero vector in the E field and the B field out there. Real energy now appears at a distance out there from a two transmitters or two wave projectors. 
And yet what's in the middle is not energy flow in the normal sense that we transmit an ordinary electromagnetic wave. It's really an artificial potential. The closest thing we have to calling it is an electrostatic wave. A more accurate description is it is a direct wave in the curvature of space-time itself. It's a general relativistic wave or a gravitational wave. So if we have two projectors, and they might be two modified radar antenna, and we intersect them at a distance, we can produce energy at a distance. And that energy arises in the space-time of that intersection zone. It doesn't matter if that's inside a mountain or inside a missile, or inside an airplane, or inside a... Can you imagine using three projectors, three, let's say, orbs, and having three orbs do this same exact effect to have the vector energy zone be the plane itself? This is why they're mapping the plane. This is why they're mapping the plane. This diagram right here, this zone right here is the area around the plane spherically. Why are they mapping the plane spherically? This is why. You're looking at it right there. Human body. Wow. I have given you now the secret of how to build Tesla's vaunted death ray to mow down people by the thousands, which you can do with that device right there. And you can modify ordinary radars to do that. It has another very nice feature. In modern physics, space-time has a very high charge, very high potential. They call it a pseudo-potential. If I lower the potential of my projectors below zero, in other words, I make negative potentials, and pretty strong negative, what happens in the intersection zone is not the appearance of energy, but the disappearance of energy. When I bend space-time, if I bend it in one fashion, the local region looks like a source. It looks like it's producing energy. If I bend it the other way, it looks like a sink. It looks like energy is... Holy crap, chat. Holy crap, I get it. I get what he's talking about, what Dave is talking about with fighting. They're bending the energy around... They're bending space-time around the, the local area. This is why it's an endothermic event. They're bending it around the endothermic event right there. <laughs> Let's listen to that again. Holy crap, I'm going to go back like 20 seconds. Can't really go. Let's go back like there. Below zero. In other words, I make negative potentials. I'm pretty strong. So he's making negative vector. So negative potentials. You're basically you are ripping through through the fabric of space and time. Strong negative. You can what suck the energy in the right out. The intersection zone is not the appearance of energy, but the disappearance of energy. Dis when I bend space time, if I bend it in one fashion, the local region looks like a source. It looks like it's producing energy. If I bend it the other way. It looks like a sink. It looks like energy is disappearing. This is real. This is general relativity. Now, conservation of energy law, Negative. the applying special relativity has gone out the window. As is well known in physics, in a local general, general relativistic system, you do not have to conserve energy at all. Don't cross the What really happens well. is I either put the energy in here and get it out there, or I take it out from there and I get it back here and I better dump it or I'll burn out my projectors. Well, it's you make a dump and you simply transform it in the other mode and switch it over to the dump. That's the way the Soviets do it. Nature has been doing this all the time in fault zones and stresses in the rocks and all the interference of the scalar potentials that are made there create fields at a distance, glowing lights. This is a picture of earthquake lights from the U.S. Geological Service. There are 1,200 locations in the United States alone where you can see glowing balls of energy electromagnetic energy, controlled energy at a distance on any decent weather night. If you care to go out there and look and take pictures, it's easy to investigate. The so-called Earth stress lights. And with this modality, by using one additional thing, by using three-dimensional interferometry and using Fourier expansions, multiple frequencies, you can make such controlled balls of electromagnetic energy at a distance just like that, like the snap of a finger. Wow. Wow. We can make balls of energy just like that, the snap of the finger. We we made the orbs. We, we made those orbs, guys. We made those orbs. I, I'm a thousand percent sure this is our technology. We figured this out. I don't know if we've, how we figured it out. Maybe we had help, but uh, sorry, I have to switch the video real quick. Oh, crap. I don't know where we were in that last video. I forgot I was going to delete the other one.
these balls of energy that they appear, right? That's that's what he's talking about. We can create a ball of energy. It's ball lightning, just like you mentioned, just like Bob Greenier mentioned, is that we can use scalar physics that appear. This one appears out of the water over here. Maybe it really did come from a submarine. Who knows? We're looking at it right here. Look at it mapping the plane, getting ready to create the negative energy potential right there around the plane. It's mapping it right there. It needs, we need to know exactly how big it is. It, it is using AI or some kind of computer system. That's what it's doing right here. Mapping the plane. No one could have come up with this. No one could have faked this video. There's nobody smart enough on the planet. It would have, the only people that could have made this is the government, just based on the science alone. This science isn't even really publicly known. I didn't go back in time unless maybe I do in the future and make this video. What if I made these videos in the future? That'd be weird. Um, okay. Maybe I can't rule out that I made the videos. Let me go back to that. Sorry, guys. I have to think. Uh, I've been doing this all the time. We measure brain waves. We measure the residue, E field and B field, that's going on. What's really going in the brain is all the little ion fields that, that make electric fields and make magnetic fields that sum to zero. The structure of that is the real activity of the human brain. I think without dwelling on it that you can see the two cerebral hemispheres make a scalar interferometer. And if those patterns are correct, you can project or create energy at a distance like inside a metal object, and you can get metal bending that way. Now, the kind of metal bending I'm talking about is not the amazing Randy bending something on his belt buckle when you're not looking at him. I'm talking about what Jack Hout does when he takes a control sample and another sample and the little old lady in tennis shoes who just happens to be a four-star general's wife bends that thing which is thick as your little finger and the highest test steel that known to aerospace industry bends that thing in an angle and it turns blue. He Sorry to pause it here, but alien scientists said you can make them by just crossing two lasers. I'm going to pull this up over here. By crossing two lasers, the Fourier series is used for the talking plasma ball so they can transmit sound through the lasers. And Jeremy, did you, dude, I don't know if you looked earlier when he talks about the resonant cavities, dude, the, this coherent matter wave beam, 100%. This is, this is the money. This is the fucking money. I'm sorry I'm swearing on YouTube, but honestly, I just don't even care at this point. I don't care about monetization. Holy crap, guys. Wow. I mean, how, how can the videos be fake if everything matches up, the science matches up? We've got secret scalar physics. It's not even a secret. It's been known since 1921. Unification theories that have been out there since 1921. Come on, man. What the hell? Takes both samples, the control sample and that sample, back to the laboratory sections and looks at them under the electron microscope. And the one that is the control sample has the normal grain structure. The one that is the one that's bent by the human being for real, not fakery, has no grain structure. The grain structure has been destroyed. It looks like the surface of the moon has been subjected to intense point heating throughout the grain structure. I have just given you the physical mechanism and the physics by which the body is able to do that. It is real. It is not a fake. Jack Halk, I believe. So that image that he just showed right there, I'm going to go back 10 seconds. So this now makes me wonder if I start wondering about the esoteric when I look at this. I think I saw Tubacabra in the chat a second ago. Two hemispheres of the brain creating an interferometer two waves essentially you know this makes me wonder about the idea of are we creating our own reality with our brains it makes me wonder about the idea of even esoteric concepts like psychic powers and remote viewing and things like that where you know are we manifesting our three-dimensional world are we tapping in to the underlying framework of the construct that we live in to paint our reality with our minds themselves uh, very wild thoughts out here. And I'm trying not to push too much in the esoteric aspect, but this certainly opens the door. Yeah, Jeremy, the question here is how do we reproduce this in the lab? How do we reproduce this with uh, commercially available equipment that doesn't cost millions of dollars? Lockheed Martin has the, the equipment in the labs that they can produce this type of stuff and these types of effects. I, it makes me wonder if there's even a situation where we just need to be able to produce the baseline. Like, can we just prove that the speed of light is not constant if we can just prove the speed of light's not constant that's also honestly enough this is just this is wild i have just given you the physical mechanism and the physics by which the body is able to do that it is real it is not a fake 
Jack Halk, I believe, does he not work for your company? Excellent fellow, excellent scientist. I won't dwell on what all else the biological system can do with that. Let us suffice to say that we can derive rigorously in terms of physics, not metaphysics. Guys, look at this list. Pyrokine or psychokinesis, precognition, postcognition, postcognition, clairvoyance, telepathy. I don't even know what firewalking is, but that sounds like a pretty sweet superpower. And then metal bending. This is like Uri Geller. Man, maybe we owe Uri Geller uh, an apology. All of the mechanisms for parapsychology. Well, if you were weaponizing that for a big weapon, if you hit this thing explosively with your projectors and you fire two pulses so the pulses meet, an interesting thing occurs. If you fire it in the high potential mode, you get an electromagnetic explosion at a distance. If you fire in the low potential mode, you get a cold explosion at a distance, the sudden withdrawal of energy in the intersection zone. Well, we need to mark that one down right there. Uh, low potential, you get a sudden suction of energy, absorption of energy at a distance. Uh, does that sound like anything uh, that is relevant? Sounds exactly like our videos, chat. Uh, I can't switch over to the videos right now because I have this one up. Both types of weapons widely deployed by the Soviet Union and tested. Uh, the recent, uh, some years back, so-called booms off the East Coast. Some of those were seen as flashes, estimated to be about 100 uh, tons of TNT equivalent, were actually the orientation and alignment of such howitzers in the Soviet Union. They have had such howitzers since April 1963. Specifically, the first operational test was April the 11th, 1963, 100 miles north of Puerto Rico. The most dramatic uh, expression of the cold explosion in recent times occurred on April the 9th, 1984, and the papers fortunately won't let this one go. Off the coast of Japan, about 150 or 200 miles, well, really 200 miles from downtown Tokyo, out near the Kuros, a sudden gigantic explosive eruption occurred above the water a cloud, so to speak, very dense, rose rapidly to 60,000 feet and 150 mile diameter. This is the other clip that I posted, guys. Uh, remember, I don't know if you guys remember, several weeks ago, or maybe a month or two ago, I posted about this where the pilots witnessed this event happen in the cold event. And they said they saw a halo type of event. He's talking about the video. I didn't realize that's the situation he's talking about, the JAL flight. This might be an actual situation where this type of technology, not the exact technology with the orbs, but the similar technology was used on another plane. Wow. What did he say? JAL 35 in 1984? Or 36? We're going we're gonna to find that. Five 747s out there, one of which was piloted by a former B-52 pilot who thought he'd just seen the most massive nuclear explosion you ever saw. It had the mushroom shape. Uh prepared evasive action, turned off course, put on oxygen mask, prepared and braced for a shock wave which never came. There was no flash. This was the cold explosion. A laser physicist friend of mine that I'm working with in California, in the laboratory where we're using only milliwatts at best, and we're using distances about that far, has done a little cold explosion over a dish of water and you get the mushroom cloud exactly like that, rising. Guys, the weird part about this, this is what uh, Catherine T saw. Catherine T says she saw a dome, like almost looked like a oil rig on the horizon, an orange one, which would have been consistent with the gas spreading out after the plane disappeared. Man, that's weird. Wow. That thing was called everything under the sun, bubbling gas, you know. Uh, plumes, all sorts of things. It was a cold explosion. The ocean there is 21,000 feet deep. It's too deep for submarines. Indicates it was a man-made phenomenon, but it didn't end there. Dr. Daniel Walker and colleagues, 
who have access to sophisticated underwater acoustic equipment and seismic equipment did a complete study on that thing. It's published in the journal Science recently. As a matter of acoustic equipment, this was 1985, guys. This was 40 years ago. They had acoustic, advanced acoustic equipment back then that could detect seismic activity. What do you think we have in 2014 when the plane disappeared? There's no way they don't know what exactly happened to this plane. They've been lying about it. They've been covering up scalar physics. In fact, after his study, he successfully ruled out any kind of ordinary known natural phenomenon. So we're left with the conclusion that he and his colleagues made it's either a man-made phenomenon or an as yet unknown natural phenomenon. We shouldn't have too many natural phenomena unknown. Real quick, I, and we'll come right back to this, guys. I want to address what Jeremy just said in the chat. I think it's important because I've been wondering about it myself. So he said, I still think they could have opened up an invisibility cloak around the plane. These three spheres might be how to set up the plasma fields. If they had laser-induced plasma bubble around the plane, they could cause whatever's inside to disappear. I've been wondering about this myself, especially as I've been digging into the advanced science and looking at stuff like optical phase conjugation. Um, the thing is, the difference between a cloaking field and teleportation when you have access to gravitational manipulation is almost just a matter of terminology at that point. This is why I find the Philadelphia experiment so interesting because they're trying to cloak the plane and hide or to cloak the ship and hide the ship. And instead they teleport it. I think it's almost just a matter of semantics. Uh, so that's why weirdly when people say, oh, they had some advanced cloaking technology that they were using. It's really just a matter of like, I think that, yes, that's consistent with what we're seeing in these videos. The plane is just going somewhere else, but there's also a time dilation effect, which basically makes it teleportation. This is why it's not a, a breakdown of all of the matter and a rebuilding of the matter. It's a matter of a warp uh, bubble around the plane, uh, which yes, in theory, it does cloak the plane. Absolutely. The only reason why I would, I don't really call it cloaking is because like I said, we see the smoke trail stop. And that's why if it was like more of traditional cloaking, like an invisibility cloak around the plane, you should still see the smoke coming out of the back of it. But I think you could still argue, you know, from a logical perspective that what we're looking at here is some type of cloaking effect, uh, effect that's happening. So also, I just want to say hi to uh, alien scientist and uh, crypto alchemist and the new people have been jumping in the chat as well. He also said, I think cloaking is much easier to pull off than teleportation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm keeping my mind open in terms of exactly what type of effect they're doing to this plane. Uh, but they definitely use some crazy advanced anti-gravitational technology that we don't really understand that seems to be based on scalar physics on the plane, no doubt. Whatever you want to call it or whatever, doesn't matter to me. I, I don't care. And they definitely covered that shit up, no question. Holy crap, guys. <laughs> that explode for 150 miles, particularly when it's happened several times before in the open literature. That is a rigorous paper published in the journal Science, uh, Science very recently. Unfortunately, the journal saw fit to turn down my colleague and my explanation of what was going on and a complete date list of incidents and history and types of Soviet weapons to back it up. Here's just one more incident to show you that these types of sudden mushroom rises from the ocean or near the ocean above the ocean in gigantic size have occurred repeatedly with other suspicious incidents. That particular earthquake is highly suspect. Can you not see that if I dump energy with very powerful radiators and continue to dump energy on both sides of a fault zone, it doesn't matter where the extra energy comes from. With a piezoelectric effect, I'm transforming that into mechanical stress. And if I do that long enough and build up enough energy, that plate is going to slip and you'll get a natural earthquake, natural looking earthquake, man-made. That's how. Wow, guys, this is getting weird. He just explained how we can make an earthquake happen. You take the fault lines, right? So we've got your, your plates that are touching together here, right? Like this. And we build up the piezoelectric energy on either side and you can force them to rumble, to interact, to cause an earthquake uh, along the fault lines. Absolutely, we should be able to do this. Now that I think about it, it seems trivial. But here's the weirdest part about it, the reason why I'm bringing it up. Remember the letter to Ashton Forbes 
what were the two videos that came out after that? I think they were actually connected to what they were trying to send me. I think that letter might be real. The one right after was about the glitter conspiracy. People looked into the glitter conspiracy and they found out the government was buying up the glitter. And the glitter was being used for some secret purpose potentially related to cloaking. And then the next letter was the one about Chan Thomas. And what was Chan Thomas doing? He was using electrical engineering to predict earthquakes. I actually think this stuff might be real. Holy crap. You make earthquakes. Well, if you do it in the cold explosion, you're going to have to dump a lot of that energy when it's 150 miles across. That is one whale of a lot of energy that you suddenly extract it, and here it comes. It's headed for you. It'll simply melt your projectors unless you dump it somewhere. So you switch the projector into the transmit mode, and you catch it and hold it in a storage bank temporarily, and then you fire it off somewhere where it won't do any harm, like Bennett Island. Here is an exhaust that is 150 miles long, seen by our weather satellites from a site that repeatedly exhibits these, almost 100 now that we've seen. This particular exhaust is about one, a little over one degree above the horizontal. Now, volcanoes don't do that. They don't look like that. Let's see the next slide. From the same island, we see double puffs indicating the interferometer transmitters. We see mul multiple puffs within them sometimes. And in fact, the satellites have even from time to time caught the actual burst showing that it's an explosive beginning of the exhaust. Guys, this is why we're using infrared to scan the world. You ever wonder why we're using infrared to uh, scan the world with our satellites, why we're using infrared with our drones? Because infrared can pick this kind of stuff up. That's why we have a multi-spectral camera. You always wonder, like, one thing I wondered when I first saw the FLIR videos, the Navy FLIR, FLIR videos, was why are we not looking optically? Wouldn't it make sense to look in optically? The answer is no. No, we want to look in infrared because we're going to see more spectrum. Now, this is why, because we've known about scalar physics. We've known about the capability, not just from us, but from our adversaries as well. And we want to be able to pick that up anywhere. Now, there's no doubt in my mind at this point that the Sibber system is in video. No question, it's video. It can pick up a missile launch. The missile launch stuff is just a cover. That's what the, the normies, the public thinks out there is, oh, it's going to pick up a missile launch out there and follow the missile right away. Putin's talking about hypersonics. This is well beyond just shooting a missile in the sky and having it shoot over to us, guys. We're talking about causing earthquakes and natural disasters. We're talking about having energy, be uh, uh, sucking energy out of a system and then taking that energy, building it up, and then shooting it out. This is like X-Men. This is like uh, really just crazy advanced stuff and very consistent with what Bob Greenier was talking about as well with this idea of taking a faucet. If you guys watch Hard Truths podcast number two and letting it build up and it builds up and as it builds up over time, you, you essentially have infinite energy that you can build up into your system. Crazy. These are weather satellites, U.S. weather satellites. They are not classified. Unfortunately, they are from way out there. We need some low-level satellite photography, which I simply do not have. Would be interesting to look at it if I had it. Here's one where the explosive burst was caught just erupting from the island. These things here blaze away sometimes for hours and hours and days at a time with those kinds of massive exhausts of heat and energy. I'll show you where they're pulling out the energy. Yeah, and real quick to what Anthony just said, multispectral, I'm betting that that includes UV and terahertz as well. So I think those cameras are much more advanced than just simple IR cameras. And this is why we're seeing the smoke come out of the back of the plane. I think that the corridor crew and the lore lodge do have one uh, point, which is that a commercial infrared camera does not pick up smoke. Uh, it, it doesn't essentially can see through smoke. But these are not basic infrared cameras. These are multispectral cameras. And the whole point is they're trying to pick up energetic events and neg entropy events like we see in the videos. So this is something that is well beyond anything that's available in the public. Um, and if we were to see the specifications of those cameras, I guarantee we are going to see the smoke coming out of the plane in those cameras. Imagine what they're doing with it. Uh, that's about the plumes, just to show you that way back there from those exhaust plumes off that island, we 
had some airplanes flew through it. They're mostly ice particles from the expansion and so forth, as you would expect when you've dumped a phenomenon. Actually, you entrain a lot of the cold air. You get circulations. You get all kinds of effects there. So you do get a lot of ice formed, a little mud, and this kind of thing. There is a second candidate right now, courtesy of some effort by Tom Harrell and some kind folks um, up at the, sat the satellite imagery outfit. Uh, this one shows, and I can't begin to, begin to pronounce that name. Can you say that for me off the slide? Novaya Zemla. Novaya Zemla, which is an island north of the Soviet Union up in the Arctic Circle there. Not too far, really as a geographical distance goes from Bennett Island. And here again on the extreme left, you see another exhaust, and you see the gigantic weather circulation that so much additional energy being poured in the area causes. You see the swirl all the way around the thing, stripping uh, vapor energy and vapor water and so forth from the snow and ice and everything else. OK. Well, in the mid-'70s, we got a shock. Suddenly, the communication systems throughout the world and the communications band, that is from 5 to 30 megahertz, were widely being interrupted by extremely powerful signals coming from the Soviet Union. To my knowledge, we have not yet located the transmitters. You guys just hear what he just said? Remember when uh, AT&T and them went out uh, a few weeks ago? And people are trying to say, oh, it was a sun, it was a coronal mass ejection from the sun. No, it wasn't. Sorry to... Uh, be the bearer of bad news more than likely that was either a hack or that was a manipulation of scalar physics that was being used to uh, attack us i also think we have to be 100 percent clear about okay the boat incident that happened recently with the bridge um that absolutely could have been a hack now i'm not saying that it was could have been an accident but absolutely could have been a hack I think that we have to look at the lens of the world through political uh, aspirations and uh, espionage, for sure, especially now going forward. They had many resemblances to what we call an over-the-horizon radar, so we promptly labeled, labeled them an over-the-horizon radar. The so-called woodpecker signal is named from the chirp signal that sounds like a woodpecker's beak hitting a flat block. You can hear them out there most every night chattering away, still interfering. In fact, they now really? sell the ham radio operator's filters so that it operates through that. Filters Never heard of that. In that region. But what they actually did, shortly before the death of Brezhnev, they started adjusting across... Guys, the other thing I'm thinking of, this is the Russian harp. Now I'm really wondering about Antarctica. I think I'm going to talk to Chad and Sherry and get back on the Investigate Earth podcast next week and talk about Antarctica. We've probably got some crazy crap going on in, down in Antarctica. And I think the location is not a coincidence either. It makes sense. If you look at the Earth's magnetic field, um, the magnetic field would be the weakest, potentially the North and South Pole. So maybe Antarctica has a, spe a specific strategic purpose for being that location. The United States, a great interference pattern from multiple transmitters of the woodpecker radars. Now, I'm not interested except for biological effects, which can be damaging, in the conventional E field, B field signals on that radar. But we don't have anybody who's measuring the scalar component, the substructure in the zero. They don't even have the instruments to do it. If they wish such instruments provided, I have a friend who will do it for price. Not me, he will. He built the instruments and, and designed them. But what they're doing here is the substructure interference, which is important, because that's where all the real energy is. You can put as much energy as you wish into that substructure, and the normal instrument will not even see it. It won't even detect it. Anyway, where the interference was, if you'll check the woodpecker signals, you'll see that's a type of interference pattern. They set up an interference pattern over the US, and it left signals, signatures. When you adjust these things, and you adjust with little slips, you pop out energy, you get rumbles and booms and airquakes and all this, and those things happened from Florida, North Alabama, Virginia, all up through the Carolinas, up through Mid-England, up through the middle of the country, Texas, all over, West Coast, everywhere. These mysterious cracks and rumbles and booms and pops and snaps everywhere while they were adjusting the grid. Well, they got it adjusted by shortly after 
the end of the year, that is in early 1983, they got this thing adjusted and they started pouring it on us. So that spring, early spring, you had extremely severe flooding because what they did, you simply determined by your timing and interferometry and Fourier transforms, which one of the grid cells you want to activate. And they're much finer than this. By the way, over Huntsville, Alabama, a friend and I saw this grid from horizon to horizon in even plowed field rows north to south and from horizon to horizon in even plowed rows from east to west. And that is not natural. It does not happen. Anyway, what they did is you, if you take energy out of one cell, that produces a low zone, a low pressure zone. If wow. you add energy in another cell, the that produces a high pressure zone. I think you can see, if I scan my radar or rotate it, the beam, either electromagnetically or rotate the antenna, gently and move those highs and lows alone, I can direct and capture and control the jet streams. And that's exactly what they did. The jet streams had a classic bend dipping way down south abnormally far and then roaring up the Adirondack chain. And so we had all kinds of good weather following that pattern and the deviation of the jet streams. Even the journal Science has published an article from a study that shows in the last decade the variation in the weather over North America has been greater than can be statistically expected except once in 1,200 years. That summer we got a drought. If you recall, we lost half the corn crop in the United States in one summer from the extreme drought. When you form one of the patterns, you get a signature in the clouds. You see a, a little droplet of water is formed around a dust particle, a little droplet of ice if it's cold enough. And it makes a little transistor or a little diode in the middle, and that thing forms its own little E field. And these things line up. And what you get is you get a ring, almost a complete ring, about two-thirds of a ring of clouds, like geometrically drawn, around the peak where the energy is, is being manipulated. And you get radial lines, thin radial lines, running directly away for 10 or 15 miles. Sort of like the old rising sun symbol in World War II. We saw these all over the United States. Here's one taking a block and a half from my home. By the time I could run in and get my camera, it had passed just over the mountain. But you can see those are cloud streamers. Those are not light rays. These are not crepuscular waves at all. These are cloud rays. These are radials, giant radials. I then went ahead and chased that thing over the mountain to get a little better shot of it. They had cut the energy so the middle ring filled up, but the rays were still apparent in the next slide although I'm now shooting at an extreme distance uh, through a telescopic lens. But you can see if the lights were a little dimmer, you could see the crosshatch interference pattern in the streamers also. So we have both the streamers and we have the crosshatch interference pattern existing in the clouds. That's over Huntsville, Alabama. Here's one that a correspondent sent in, and again, we have dim light. The clouds are actually more prominent than that from California. They were seeing them all over the United States, these very prominent, very significant patterns everywhere. I went on radio, uh, KABC in Los Angeles, calling everybody's attention to this two or three times, delivered papers at a couple of symposia, and we saw a change. We saw the doggone thing start getting active most of the time at night. There's another pattern. Sometimes they use two patterns close together. When that happens, the internal rings go out and the rays become much thicker and they become absolutely boat-tailed toward the center. Now, when they cut the power, the center fills up immediately with clouds. I have been unfortunate, and although I have seen classic ones of this, I have not yet got a decent picture. I will show you what I have, which is not a good photograph, and the photographs then, therefore, should not be accepted as proof until I get better photographs which I will do sooner or later. Again, multiple witnesses over Huntsville, Alabama, a good friend of mine, and I saw this very early in the morning, this system motoring along, absolutely classic. I was very hard pressed that day on my normal job and did not take off from work and go home and get my camera. I have regretted it ever since, deeply. I didn't realize how rare the phenomenon was going to be, to be able to get one that perfect. But it was absolutely flawless and it looked just like that right over Huntsville, Alabama, moving along at, oh, 20 to 30 miles an hour. A second one came over later that day. 
There's the dates and the time. Uh, in their weather control, if you recall, they gave us anomalous winter, the very cold December snap of 1983, which broke all the records everywhere. Many of them since records had been kept on the cold. And that was deliberately engineered. They left signatures before they did it with these kinds of things all over the US. We saw the same day uh, remnants of a second twin giant radial system that motored along across Huntsville, Alabama. Now, here is one, they've cut the power, but the system persists for a while. It'll persist for several hours, but it'll fill in. It will lose its classic shape. But, you know, even a filled-in picture is better than no picture, but I don't have a lens which will take the entire sky. I need a fish eye, which I'm going to get as soon as I can afford it. But what I want to show you is this is on the, I believe, the northeast here, and I want to focus your attention here over to the right. You will see the lines of the clouds going there. They go all over the sky, back to the other radial on the other side. Complete. Sorry, I was muted there. Um... Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the what he just showed with the, the trails in the sky right here, do you think this can explain contrails in terms of what people see in the sky? Uh, it makes me wonder, because I don't think that what we see can be explained solely based on uh, like plane seeding the sky. It makes me think that electromagnetic effects are more... Um, can, can explain this in a much better way than like just, oh, we're shooting planes or we're seeding the sky with chemicals and stuff that are out there. Uh, Jeremy as well, because you guys can't see the chat uh, if you're watching right now, uh, mentioned that Eric Hecker, uh, the person that went on Sean Ryan and blew the whistle on Antarctica, uh, first came onto one of alien scientist Jeremy Reese's live streams and called into his show, said he was blown away. If you guys haven't been following alien scientists, definitely check him out. Um, in the comments, I was pointing out that I think that 90% or more of the UFO community is full of crap. Um, it's not that I think that they are lying. I just think that they don't understand the implications of all of this. If you are absorbing this information like I am absorbing this information right now, uh, then you can realize like the huge implications of this. This means that what the public sees is just a small fraction of the global espionage and covert actions that are happening all the time in the whole world. Imagine manipulating the weather, manipulating the weather. It's almost April and it's, there's like a foot of snow outside where I'm at right now. Um, you could see why Russia would want to manipulate this, especially given their climate. You could see why any country would want to manipulate it. In fact, I would imagine that they would come into some kind of stalemate where they say, Hey, chill out on manipulating my weather, chill out on the earthquakes, etc." cetera. Uh, pretty wild stuff. I mean, the implications of this are huge. And then, when you add in the element of a non-human intelligence potentially visiting us, this is, we're talking about like magic and wondering whether or not our government really is controlled by a higher power that we have no visibility to whatsoever. Incredible stuff. Let's keep going. Want to focus your attention here over to the right. You will see the lines of the clouds going there. They go all over the sky back to the other radial on the other side completely over your head is this giant radio connected up to two points, even though it's filling in now because the power has been cut. In this photograph, we're just a little bit back around from where we were to the left to show that the same cloud streaks and radials are going over on the left and they go completely across for about 15 miles to the next point, the next radial intersection where they link up. So real quick, no wonder we are scanning the ionosphere all the time because we're we're scanning the ionosphere because we want to see if our enemies are using scalar physics against us we want to see if they are manipulating gravity gravity if they are manipulating the weather if they are manipulating earthquakes we want to try to be able to detect it instantly because this becomes national defense at this point everything seems to boil down to national security and national defense now we'll show that other linkage down on the other end as a separate shot and this really, as you can see, it does go on down there and link up. It's just beyond the tree line where it links. It's faded on that end pretty good. But we had a whole two radial system, a poor 
picture here, I admit. But having seen much better ones than this when I did not have a camera or access to one, I can only tell you that in the future I will show you a decent photograph if they keep this thing up over Huntsville, Alabama long enough. He keeps mentioning Huntsville, Alabama. Guys, you look up Huntsville, Alabama, that's where a NASA uh, Marshall Space Laboratory is. So I don't think that's a coincidence. It's, it's always Huntsville, Alabama and Los Alamos. And this is where, uh, and I think uh, Jeremy has kind of pulled back a little bit on his position on Bob Lazar, but I think Bob Lazar is being truthful about his opinion. Whether or not he's been fed some disinformation, I think, is a different question. But I think he really did work at Los Alamos, and I think that those are the two locations, um, NASA Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama, and Los Alamos. If they're putting this stuff together to build orbs or do whatever they've got to do, those are the places where I'm first checking out. And if Tom Harold and other assorted good stalwart fellows help me keep watch for them when I'm working inside and not out looking at the sky. Well, you wonder what happened to you on February the 1st. Let me tell you what happened to you on February the 1st. On December the 8th, they started this little goodie. Out in California, they were having these little rumbles and cracks and pops and snaps off the coast there from, Cali from uh, Los Angeles. They had it for about a week off and on. I was there on a the radio show delivering an address on free energy. Went on another show to try to explain what these things was and I predicted based on this that they had finished adjusting the grid and there would be a violent or drastic change in the weather within 48 hours. I went on the radio and I made that statement and the radio announcer said, you sound like a wacko and cut me off. That's some of the mild things I've been caused. <laughs> it does not matter. I operate on the thing that if the experiments keep working and they contradict the theory, the true scientific method says you must change the theory, not insist that the experiment is false if it continues to be replicated. So what happened was they then, when they got it adjusted, a high wind came up very suddenly, totally unexpected, blew down all the trees on the boulevards. They had wrecks and everything. I was there during this process, and it was within 48 hours from that prediction. Violent sort of windstorms. Uh, winds got very high in the Los Angeles area, and all the orange trees were laying over flat everywhere through the boulevards. It went on down in Texas, spawned tornadoes, and roared up the Adirondack chain, and then they bent the jet stream in a most anomalous fashion. They bent that sucker right down the west coast of the United States, all the way down to the bottom and turned it and went across the bottom, skimming across just above the bottom. of. Imagine you can manipulate electromagnetic potentials and you can create a gravitation, or not a gravitation, but an electromagnetic bubble. So you imagine like there's a bubble right here where I'm, I'm scrolling the mouse through. You could see how you can manipulate the jet stream, right? As if you made a bubble right here in the middle of the United States, you can manipulate the jet stream. And by this, you can manipulate the weather. It's not a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to make it rain right here, but it's more of a matter, and although you probably can at this point, if with the right quantum computers and precision, possibly pull that off. But it's more of a matter of just changing it, right? Changing the direction of travel of the jet stream in general. Um, certainly seems within the realm of possibility given the science that we've been looking at here tonight. Texas and then roaring up the Adirondack chain. I've never seen that fashion before, but they set about doing that in December 1984. They kept playing with the jet stream. They did all kinds of nice experiments. They split the thing into two. They made it form into Ys and it looked like they were just checking out to see what all they could do. But with this fashion here, what you do is when you turn, you entrain circulation from way out over the Pacific, as shown by the purple arrows. You pull moisture all the way from out in the Pacific and suck it up right across the United States. And if you do the, the neat little trick with the cold stuff, you get enough cold stuff bent down from Canada and the Arctic here, guess what you're going to get with all that moisture? You're going to get snow and ice. And February the 1st, they let us have it. And that's our infamous ice storm right here in Huntsville, Alabama. All this was going on just before that. Having gone several days without power myself, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the fact that I don't like that, and I hope you didn't either. But that was given to you courtesy of the Hammer and Sickle Boys. 
Okay, there are a couple other Hammer little things I'll boys. throw in just for little goodies. You may or may not have seen the paper on the Associated Press release, but I'll give Guys, I love, he calls them Hammer and Sickle Boys. I love Thomas Beardson. I wish I could have met this guy. Thomas Beardson, sorry. Um, I just love everything about this guy. I'll give you the mechanism. And everybody else will tell you I'm totally crazy. And I'll say to you, then you explain it. Or ask them to. Love it. And listen to their jaw fly open and find out they have no explanation at all. Because this explanation isn't in the textbook. The Navy was having a chaff drop off the coast from San Diego. A very strange and sudden and unexpected wind again arose. You know, when we form these lows, wind rushes in. And so we got another one, and here came a signature, a sudden, strange, unexpected wind. Caught the entire chaff cloud. They were about 150 miles off the coast there, and blew the thing in towards San Diego. Now, this is the standard microwire chaff actually with a dielectric with a coating on it. There's a certain way it's structured for some kinds of chaff that we have shown in the laboratory will reflect a scalar wave. I won't go into that, that's proprietary to my friend. Imagine every little piece of chaff up there, if the bandwidth, if a scalar signal in that frequency in its bandwidth that it's cut for is there, it will reflect it. That's what we're saying. And from any two of those things randomly wiggling and jiggling around, you're gonna have random intersections and interferences from the reflected scalar beams. And in that little random interference zone, you're gonna get a sudden flash, a sudden sparkle, it won't be visual, but a sudden production of ordinary electromagnetic energy. And so imagine a zone around the chaff cloud with little twinkles if you could see ordinary electromagnetic energy, if you, if you could see them as visual things, twinkling and twinkling away, and these represents little instantaneous kindling of energy points. When they move through the system area, they appear in the space-time. Faraday cages and your EMI shielding we all use in military equipment have absolutely zero effect on them. They knocked out over 60, 000, power to over 60,000 homes in San Diego. Did and you, you had the strange glitter? thing of the part of the city uh, very angry at the Navy and claiming the Navy had done this. And the Navy set out an investigation and got the foggiest notion what happened. I just told you what happened and gave you. Did he just mention glitter? Uh, we're going to go back to that for a second. 4653. I'm going to go back. JK Philly fan saying something about glitter here. Then you explain it or ask them to. I want to listen to that one more time and listen to their jaw fly open and find out they have no explanation at all because this explanation isn't in the textbook. The Navy was having a chaff drop. Chaff off equals from glitter? Santa chaff equals glitter is what people are saying in the chat. Pretty wild. Yeah, the glitter thing and the glitter conspiracy to me seems very relevant. We're doing something with glitter that I don't fully understand. Bearden is deceased, and yes, uh, Dave Rossi did meet him. I know that for a fact. Um, yeah, he passed away a few years ago. I wish I would have met this guy. I kind of feel like the reincarnation of him and to some degree. I'm not nearly as smart as him, but wow. Diego, a very strange and sudden and unexpected wind again arose. You know, when we form these lows, wind rushes in. And so we got another one, and here came a signature, a sudden, strange, unexpected wind caught the entire chaff cloud, they were about 150 miles off the coast there, and blew the thing in towards San Diego. Now, this is the standard microwire chaff, actually with a dielectric with a coating on it. There's a certain way it's structured for some kinds of chaff that we have shown in the laboratory will reflect a scalar wave. I won't go into that, that's... Holy crap, did you guys just hear that? They can manipulate glitter to create a dielectric wave for scalar potentials wait what how are they using it so imagine like glitter is like a little magnet a tiny little magnet someone walk me through how they're using this i don't i don't understand the application of it but it seems very relevant here proprietary to my friend Imagine every little piece of chaff up there, if the bandwidth, if a scalar signal in that frequency, in its bandwidth that it's cut for is there, it will reflect it. That's wow. If it's cut for a specific frequency or bandwidth, it will reflect it. 
No wonder we're buying up glitter. Holy, that the glitter thing is a serious, serious thing. Serious conspiracy. Holy shit. Holy crap. The glitter thing is real, huh? The Chan Thomas and the glitter thing were not a joke. Whoever sent me the letter knew about all this ahead of time. They knew about this ahead of time. There's the only that's the only way. This really narrows down the number of possibilities in terms of who could have sent me the letter. There's no, it wasn't a coincidence that they sent me the glitter conspiracy and that they sent me the Chan Thomas thing. They wanted me to figure this out. They wanted me to figure this out. They wanted us to know the truth. Holy crap. That's what we're saying. So imagine Imagine for a second, I'll visualize it for you, that you take a mount of glitter and you throw it in the sky and it rains down. You're raining down glitter. This is going to reflect waves that are trying to bounce off of it. This is essentially this basic mechanism that he's talking about here. Yeah, and to Jeremy Scientist saying this video is super old. This is from 1985. This video is from 1985. Holy crap. And from any two of those things randomly wiggling and jiggling around, you're going to have random intersections and interferences from the reflected scalar beams. And in that little random interference zone, you're going to get a sudden flash, a sudden sparkle. It won't be visual, but a sudden production of ordinary electromagnetic energy. And so imagine a zone around the chaff cloud with little twinkles, if you could see ordinary electromagnetic energy, if you, if you could see them as visual things twinkling and twinkling away, and these represents little instantaneous kindling of energy points. When they move through the system area, they appear in the space-time. Faraday cages and your EMI shielding we all use in military equipment have absolutely zero effect on them. They knocked out over 60, 000, power to over 60,000 homes in San Diego, and you had the strange thing of the part of the city uh, very angry at the Navy and claiming the Navy had done this. And the Navy set out an investigation and got the foggiest notion what happened. I just told you what happened and gave you the mechanism. That isn't all that happens. I hope you realize that I am stating... So the chaff cloud can be used as like a jamming. So you can drop the chaff cloud to interfere with the electromagnetic uh, and scalar potential waves that they are trying to manipulate the weather or whatever else you can think of it as like a countermeasure for the effects of uh the espionage that might be occurring at the highest levels to manipulate the weather as well as to create earthquakes you drop the chaff down and it's now gonna bounce all the the waves all over the place scatter them in every direction now it can also create if you would think of it as like a, a dead zone around the area where you drop the chaff pretty wild Chaff is glitter turned into radar, such as enemy MIGs missile locking on radar frequency. If the enemy aircraft gets a missile lock on, on you, you release the chaff. Exactly. Exact same concept, right? Is that you're getting to say, okay, you've got a lock. You've sh sent your beam, your, your uh, wave at the object. And well, I'm going to scatter it. I'm going to confuse it so that it doesn't know where it's going to go. The heat, no, heat seeking missile uh, will chase the chaff instead. Absolutely. That is, in my opinion, the Soviet Union has been waging a certain kind of undeclared war on the United States for a period of over two decades, and that several hundred people have already died in that war, American citizens, illegally. All of you recall the mysterious airliner, the airliner that fell mysteriously rather for six miles in about a uh, couple of minutes. What happened? Well, he's motoring along up there coming in towards Los Angeles. He's out of San Francisco there. He hits a sudden little pocket of turbulence. Ring any bells? Some interference going on where the energy wasn't zero anymore and you're getting energy in one fashion or the other or ripples. Turbulence. All of a sudden, one engine flames out just past that. Well, one of the things that'll kindle this stuff into being is a plasma or a flame the fierce flame in a jet engine, you know, the plasma that it forms, so to speak, the ions. You can get the same effect in the ions. A Geiger tube, for example, will detect, a Geiger counter will detect these. It doesn't detect nuclear radiation, it detects its own ionization. This will give you additional ionization 
or kill ionization and the tube will detect that. So one engine flamed out and then all the other fell, uh, all the others failed and this thing fell. The pilot struggled with the airplane, began to regain control as he got much lower down around 15,000 feet. Meanwhile, the landing gear had come down, the door fallen off, damaged the tail. He finally got control of the thing down around 11,000 feet, some control. The engines began to restart and at about 9,000 feet he got her under control again and managed to fly that thing into San Francisco, the nearest airport and land. It left a signature. Now they're going to say the pilot did that. I'm going to tell you what happened, in my opinion, you understand. What actually happened was, as I described it, from the scalar stuff that was up there, it happened to be at the right frequency. When he, it was a high interference zone, well up there, he was flying at 41,000 feet, he was way up there. When he passed out of the interference zone, the stuff started dying back out. It charges mass just like a capacitor, it has a discharge time constant, we've proven that. When it discharged the effect, the plane was then a normal type of flame exhaust, and so the thing could start again. Now it left a signature. The instruments on the airplane disagreed with one another because the electromagnetic response of an instrument or the components of an instrument to scalar is not in the specifications for that component. In the future we will be able eventually to buy components where that the second order effects, the scalar effects are controlled and we'll buy them to those specs also. Right now you can't do that. So some of the he just name dropped second order effects as well. So what else is a second order effect is a hologram, where a hologram is the potential where you create a three D object out of a two D picture, using lasers, using light, etc. Second order effects is extremely important here in terms of what we're talking about. I'm also now extremely skeptical of if Air France four four seven was not a victim of this kind of technology. The official story behind Air France Air, uh, 447 was that the pilots forgot which way up was. How, here's another uh, explanation. They got hit by some kind of scalar wave and that plane got crashed. How do you know the difference? The instruments will respond one way and some will respond the other way. The flight instruments told the pilot and crew one thing and the flight recorder told an entirely different story. The flight crew instruments reported that the autopilot was gone, out of, you know, had, had quit, and it was up to the pilot to fly the airplane. So the pilot was taking proper emergency procedures for that kind of an emergency. Engine flame out, autopilot gone. He was trying to do the job. The flight recorder recorded that the engines never died out, or at least most of them didn't, and that the autopilot never died out. Now I submit to you that when your engines flame out in a jet, it's about like running into almost a brick wall, suddenly a very soft, spongy wall, or like having a big blowout on your car. There's not much way a seasoned pilot can fail to notice engine flame out, particularly all four engines. So we can take the pilot's word for that. It's the instruments which lied because they had a uh, response to the scalar stuff that disagreed with each other. One responded one way, one the other. That will never appear in the official investigation. Now, that is not the only airplane having such difficulties. One of the European nations, which I shall not name, has repeated difficulties with their airplanes flying off the west coast. And that is not in the newspaper, and that has not been announced, but it is a fact, and I'm prepared to back it up if I have to. So one thing, guys, is the way that Thomas Bearden is talking in this video is not the way that somebody who's making up information talks. He's speaking off the cuff. He's speaking directly from his knowledge base in his head. The only basis here is that he's either been fed misinformation or what he's saying here is true to what he knows to be real or not. There's certainly some aspects of this which are his opinion, which he said several times in here as well where he's seen an event happen, he may not have inside information, but he's giving his opinion on what could have caused it. For the most part, everything that I've been listening to from Thomas Beard in here on this particular video seems to ring true. This guy is not a liar. You can tell right off the bat that he is not making this up. Um, so that really is why I find this so compelling in addition to the fact that it matches up with everything we've been saying so far. I did see the comment about uh, Jack Sarfati. I will mention that here at the end. 
Um, I am planning on interviewing Jack Sarfati on Sunday, so he will be on the Hard Truths podcast. At any rate, we have had multiple cases, not quite so dramatic, and continuing cases of the same phenom phenomenon on a less drastic scale, and it continues to this day. Okay, now what I've gone through here for the last period is a presentation to you on a scheme by means of which you can control the weather around the world. Perhaps you can't control it absolutely, but you can certainly drastically influence it. Drastically influence it, right? You can do a lot of other things I hope you see. I hope you notice that we can knock out missiles, airplanes, anything electronics, including the electromagnetic responses of the yep. human being. In Afghanistan, when the high-end helicopters come in and fire gas, now gas kills people, but even with nerve gas, they kick a while. It takes a few seconds at least to die, and the body goes into violent responses. Very violent if you've ever seen an animal die from nerve gas. Many of the people that are killed die with nerve gas. Some are given mustard, hit with mustard and so forth. They die with those symptoms. But there is another symptom which also is exhibited. And I have this on correspondence from people who've been there on the scene. Some of the people simply cut off wherever they are. Their nervous system never fires another input anywhere in their body. No reflex action, no nothing. No kicking, no fighting, no fuss, no fury. Instantaneous death, and that is a scalar signature. Fortunate Instantaneous death? Okay, anybody who doesn't think Havana syndrome can be possible, uh, just go ahead and watch this video. Because at this point, what we've figured out here from, or what we've discovered, I guess, from scalar physics is that you can just shut off all the electromagnetic signatures of the human body. That's just going to shut you down like a shutting down a robot. Hitting the off switch. Good night. Do you know why this is so compelling to me? The reason why this is so compelling is because that kind of explains death. Sometimes you've seen people just keel over, collapse, turn off, etc. Is that's the electromagnetic or the electric synapses just boom, stop they stop firing. This is extremely scary. Definitely brings in the concept of psych psychotronic weapons being possible, etc. Lee. I used to say one nation, I will now say two nations which are non-hostile to the United States, also have these weapons. I shall not name those nations publicly and have had them for an extended period of time, at least since shortly after 1969. Right now, the only thing that stops the Soviet Union from feeling free to move with this kind of weaponry, which I think you can begin to see the implications against tanks or anything else electronically controlled on the battlefield, is the other two nations, not the United States. So for a period of time, one of my purposes has been to warn the system a new kind of electromagnetics, a more extended electromagnetics already exists in the textbooks and been there since 1921. With this kind of electromagnetics, we can achieve types of engineering we have only dreamed of in the past. And this time, it's not us that got the atomic bomb first. It's the other guy. Thank you for your attention. Wow. Holy crap, man. Holy crap. P.O. Box 1472, Huntsville, Alabama, 35807. Well, this is insane. I'm going to leave this up because apparently it goes for like another eight minutes where it talks about this, but I, I want to interact with the chat for a minute here as well while we do this. Uh, probably top 10 craziest videos I've ever seen, and I've seen some crazy stuff out there. Um, absolutely feels like there's an aura of authenticity. <laughs> okay, okay, Jesus. Uh, feels like there's an aura of authenticity uh, related to this. Uh, Lulu was very upset right there. I think I rolled the chair over her tail right there. Um, what is it saying here?
And guys, I have at least one or two more videos related to this, by the way. What is this? Worked in USSR, escaped to Brazil, did secret experiments, large sea area could be suddenly frozen. May 1985, killer tornadoes devastated parts of Ontario, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Over 90 people were killed and extensive damage occurred. Maybe this is why we hate Russia so much. This is actually right here. We're looking at the uh, what he was just talking about, that bubble. Strong swirls occurred just before the tornadoes of May 31st, 1985 developed. Definitely feels like we should be able to predict the weather given this information about the jet streams. Huh. Does make me wonder about poles flipping, but we would we'd be able to figure it out if so. I hate that they put these uh, hyphens in there. What a crazy video, everybody. MK Ultra Subproject 68 or 168. Scalar EM, wait, wait, what was that? Limitations of the ordinary general relativity theory. Scalar EM represents a new view of general relativity, electromagnets, and physical reality. No, I agree for sure. I agree for sure. I think we're our, I think we're the ultimate baddies, guys. The ultimate pro uh, fundamental problem also exists. Oh, okay, oh, went too fast. It is the axiom for the zero vector vector analysis. Discard zero summations of the systems and active vectors. This is pretty much just a repetition uh, of what we've already been ta watching here for the last hour related to these videos. Where did the energy go? It produces stress energy of the vacuum. That's what Salvatore Pius told us. To the external observer, energy always applies to a single force moving through a distance against a resistance. It doesn't apply to a system of dynamic forces that the sum always to a zero vector. What was that? Goes a little bit too fast here. To a zero vector resultant. For that case, a new term should be used, scalar physics. In scalar EM, the infolded energy locked in, locked inside a zero vector system as a stress energy of the vacuum is called an energy. Huh. This is very similar to what I've learned from Dave Rossi. Very, very similar. In fact, it's, now I'm wondering if this isn't where he learned it from. In scalar EM, a new term is added to the laws of conservation of energy. Any one way, is that say eating, gating, gating process from an energy to energy yields free energy, since the an energy is automatically replenished by the universe. So I think the idea there is that the underlying framework of reality the ether or whatever you want to call it, the construct, the matrix has infinite negative energy. Hmm. It then becomes the law of conservation of an energy. Total equivalence of an energy, energy and mass is conserved. So this then would be a con this would be a modification of the laws of thermodynamics in terms of conservation of energy is that we add an additional uh, variable, an energy. And if you add the, the additional energy, the variable of an energy, now you can tap into the underlying framework of the construct and you can borrow that energy from it, which is essentially an infinite energy supply source. This is how you can get free energy. And I just came up with that right now from looking at this. Yeah, fusion is free energy as well, as alien scientists pointed out. But what happened to all this ordinary general relativity? Note, our statements about OGR, 
I think that's ordinary general relativity, will be referenced to an excellent text. Meisner, no, that's different Meisner. Meisner, Thorne, Wheeler. I assume that's John Wheeler. Uh, Gravitation, W.H. Freeman, and Co., San Francisco, 1973. Hmm. Ordinary general relativity. Man, this is killing me how fast this goes right here ordinary general relativity assumes the always problem of the non-zero stress energy of the vacuum so basically adding an, an, an energy fixes that problem in OGR pre precise definition of gravitational field is not given in OGR charge conservation and Maxwell's laws are upheld by our art, uh, artificence and assumption In OGR, the vacuum is modulated as per uh, as a perfect fluid. Excluded are shear stress, anisotropic, anisotropic, uh, anisotropic pressure, and viscosity. This restricts the stress energy tensor. Jack uh, Sarfati was talking about the stress energy tensor yesterday as well, and so it's Salvatore Pius. OGR is restricted to a special case. Conservation of laws is assumed. Applied auto. Hmm. All local frames are just assumed to be Lorentz frames. So this is like the Lorentz uh, frame, dra frame dragging effect. This is way too fast. Conservation of all, physicists, uh, of all physics are strongly discouraged from considering that, excuse me, general relativity can be easily engineered in a local electromagnetic system. Isotropic means all going in the same direction. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Dynamic zero vector systems are not considered in an OGR classical electromagnetics. A priori, a zero vector EM system polarizes the vacuum deterministically. Hmm. Polarizing the vacuum state is another thing that Dave Rossi mentioned several times. A, z a zero vector system produces a controlled and ordered stress energy tensor of a vacuum that can be produced that can, that can produce macroscopic effects locally. Huh. Talking about the videos now. A zero vector system accumulator inertial work has no energy except vacuum stress energy can yield energy of its components ah anistropic means non-uniformity good to know mass has a tons of tons of energy if we could find a way to release the trapped fields e equals mc squared yeah that makes sense in ogr vacuum polarization produces a non-zero stress energy tensor unobservable except by its gravitational effects i don't know what does mtw411 mean hmm. scalar electromagnetics easily produces a non-zero stress energy tensor of the vacuum that it is macroscopically observable seems pretty big Scalar EM thus violates both Newtonian gravity and severe constraints of uh, original general relativity. In original general relativity, Newtonian gravity is used to argue that the non-zero stress energy tensor of the vacuum is unobservable. Huh. So we've messed up the laws of physics. To detect rhythmic, uh, rhythmic variations in the non-zero stress energy tensor of the vacuum, here's a scalar wave detector. So this is just an electric system, Faraday cage, pickup coil, resonant tuning circuit, tuning capacitor, preamp, can't read some of the words, tuning something, shielded cable, and I can't tell what that says. So it's definitely just an electric system, though. Hmm. 
If you're interested in this, check out electrical engineering. Detector is designed by John Burney, uh, OGR shutters, uh, away from fixing the geometry and letting the four cons uh, conservation laws be violated. Okay, this is gonna be very relevant. I'm gonna show you guys a post here after this about violating the laws of conservation. In scalar electromagnet, uh, electromagnetic, uh, such as artificial adherence to the conservation of laws is not assumed. Scalar EM is a means of direct conservation of electromagnetic energy to gravitational energy and vice versa. So we can manipulate gravity. What does that say? In scalar EM, all conservation laws can be locally violated and of 10 with ease. And oh, often with ease. Okay. So we can violate the laws of conservation of momentum. Einstein's formula for gravitational radiation is not a consequence of the general theory of relativity. Interesting. This is a source right here, I think. In general relativity, there are no energy momentum conservation laws for a system co uh, consisting of matter and the gravitation of AL f gravitational field. Okay, makes sense. This is hard to read. We're almost done here. Comment, okay. I.e. in a local general relativistic system, conservation laws do not apply. Soviets have weaponized an unrestricted, whoops, the Soviets have weaponized the unrestricted and local general relativity for over 30 years. This was back in 1985. So that would push it back to 1955. So, wow, we've really just been hiding the science. The whole world has been hiding the science. Scalar electromagnetics allows the direct engineering of space time and hence physical relativity or reality itself. We would have never figured this out without the, the uh, MH370 videos. How crazy is that, chat? So, without the MH370 videos, we potentially. At least I would never potentially figure this out. I would have been a CNN brain for life. I would have thought this is fake. Um, but we have videos showing this. We have videos showing this happen. Right here, they were recording it on two cameras. They never thought it would get leaked to the public. They never thought anyone would leak this footage. Uh, we can see dynamic parallax in these clouds. These are real clouds. These are not rendered. This is not after effects that we're looking at here in this video. Um, this is why we see these ball lightning orbs here, which are consistent with scalar physics. What Thomas Beard Bearden just mentioned, he said that we can produce these balls of lightning, balls of plasma, if you will. This is why when I looked at these and I figured out that what we're looking at here is a field around the object. That's how this is not a, a solid field, a solid object. We're looking at a ball of energy here at this point. No one could have ever even come up with this. There's no... There's no VFX artist that could even have thought of this. They would have had no idea how to even create this. Probably the strongest evidence for why what we're looking at here is real is based on the physics that we just looked at. Uh, they were recording this because they wanted to collect information about it. Now that I think about it, probably to give back to the engineers and scientists. Several people that know about this would never be able to talk about it. They've probably seen other stuff like this that's just as crazy, honestly. The reason why they're showing us the slow-mos here, I even wonder if this is not from the original footage, is because they want us to see that this is actually legit 100% real. This color variant that we see, this rainbow palette, might only, this might be completely classified. This rainbow palette we see here like this, this multispectral video, it's very possible that the public has intentionally never seen this type of video because they don't want the public to have any frame of reference for what the military is capable of in terms of uh, surveillance capabilities. That's why they showed us the black and white. They intentionally showed us the black and white into the 2017 FLIR footage 
because they don't want us to know about what their capabilities are. I, I think 100% this is our technology. This is not aliens at all. That's the reason why the Jeremy Corbells of the world say it's bullshit because they care, care about alien technology. They don't care about our technology. We're exposing, MH370X is exposing our technology. This is what we have the capability to do. There's no aliens in these videos. That's why Corbell hates it because there's no aliens. The dude loves aliens. He wants everything to be aliens. And maybe there are aliens out there. I don't know. I don't care, honestly. What I care about is this is our technology. And the way they're able to convince the world is because nobody looks at this and thinks that we can pull this off. But we can. We can pull this off. And here they're doing the exact same thing. They're manipulating with scalar physics and gravitational potential the neg entropy of the vacuum state. So guys, if somebody faked this, they would have had to have been, they would have to know about Thomas Bearden and they would have had to look at his physics from 1985 and they would have had to incorporate this into the videos because what we see here is exactly what he just talked about. Um, these are not fake videos. This is what we did to the plane. Um, whether or not this is a cloaking or annihilation or a teleportation event, really doesn't matter to me. Uh, all I've ever cared about is that we tell the truth about what the United States government did to this plane with our super advanced scalar physics technology. There it is right there in super slow-mo. Uh, if you're making a fake video, how many fake videos have you guys seen where they show super slow-mo of the videos and show all of the details in super slow-mo? The reason why you wouldn't do that is because you don't want people to see that you made a mistake somewhere. There's no mistakes in any of these videos. That's just what we did to the plane. Simple as that. Now, the last thing I want to show tonight before we log off for the evening, uh, I want to show Twitter real quick. So one thing I want to show you guys on Twitter is my buddy Dave Rossi. Uh, Zed Podcast is what I think he goes by. What the hell? Uh, what's his thing? Guys, what's this thing? Um, Podcast Z, is that what it is? There it is. Okay. Guys, look at what he has pinned to his profile. A very special thank you to Expanding Real for pointing this out to me. Yet again, here we go. And yes, the second law of thermodynamics is violated while maintaining conservation of momentum and energy. I've always wondered when I look at this image of on his pinned profile from April 2023 before I ever met him, months before I ever met him, why he was showing us this. He wants to show us that scalar physics is real. This is why he showed us this. Why he has a his profile. Plasma generator, much He's like showing a us rotary spark gap. The difference is, and is that. Like this is how it so is happening in the middle of a rotating so magnetic you vortex. You can and show because of that, the power the that is taken in is dispersed and in no the vortex the like a hurricane or a tornado. Sorry, just there you go. throws no has any idea debris all over the place, but it stays in the swirl. This is a plasma generator. Much like a rotary spark gap. Profile says over unit the difference is, over unit is that solid state it is happening in the is middle of a rotating gravity. magnetic vortex. And because of that, the power that is taken in is dispersed in the vortex like a... Oh, I apologize. So, like, I, sorry, I, I muted that. I apologize. But... This is why it's violating the conservation. Uh, it's it's violating the laws of thermodynamics. So it's it's tapping into the underlying framework and construct of the universe to borrow energy from it, just like Thomas Bearden was talking about in the scalar physics. This is why Dave has this pinned to his profile. I've been wondering this whole time. Why does he have this pinned to his profile? This is why. He's just telling the whole world. The whole world has no idea. The whole world is looking at it in this video. It's out there in the public. It's on TikTok. It's out there on Twitter. And no one has any idea this stuff's real because most of the public is full of idiots. 
that nobody thinks for themselves, nobody does any scientific research for themselves, and they just believe whatever they've been told to be real. This only has 26,000 views. Only has 26,000 views. He has it pinned to his profile since April of 2023. Because people care more about random political drama than they care about science and real science that might be possible. Wow. What a revolutionary eye-opening night we had here, guys. So thank you guys for jumping on this stream tonight. Uh, I am going to close it out here since we've been going for two hours. There are at least one, maybe two more videos of Thomas Bearden that we are going to jump into tomorrow night and this weekend. And then I am going to interview. I have scheduled to interview Jack Sarfati on Sunday. I think I'm planning on doing it live. There is a possibility I will pre-record it. I'm not 100% sure. I do want to build it up a little bit. There could be some fireworks. Um, somebody mentioned as well, what do you think about Jack Sarfati talking last night? I'm not sure how much of what he says is true. I think that he knows the physics for sure. The physics of what Jack Sarfati has been saying is, is dead on. But the difference between Thomas Beard is Thomas Beard is an engineer. Jack Sarfati is a physicist. We have to kind of reconcile these. Jack Sarfati is looking at it from the theoretical physics perspective. And the engineers are looking at it from this is what we can create. How do we explain it perspective? Yeah, am I on the spectrum? Guys, I don't even know what autistic even means. I don't give a shit what autistic means. If it means somebody that's figured out by history and research uh, what the nature of our universe is, then sure, call me arti uh, artistic. <laughs> call me artistic. Uh, guys, What I'm no artist. You call me an artist? I don't think. What is think? That's ghetto. I know. I know. If you guys don't know what that's from, look up the Suki Hana and Bobby Altoff interview. Um, probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. So, guys, I'm artistic. I'm artistic out here. Uh, yeah, autism is basically just one of those things they invented to make people feel special. Um, I, I don't. I don't believe in any of that crap. I think you control your own uh, your own reality. You control what other people think about you. And if you victimize yourself in a way to convince yourself that you're a victim and that your special needs or whatever, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So, okay, guys, I'm going to drop off. Yeah, I'm not a musician. I make music. You mean ma magician? No, I'm not a musician. I don't think. I know. Anyway, guys, I appreciate it. Uh... Thank you guys very much for jumping on this tonight. I will try to set up a follow-up tomorrow where we do another video on Thomas Bearden. Now that we know the framework, uh, we can begin to understand some of the more advanced concepts. I will also uh, most likely tomorrow be clipping. I took some notes here, clipping some of the segments from that and posting it on my Twitter if you guys want. Thank you. Special thank you to uh, Jeremy Reese, the alien scientist, uh, Bernie, uh, crypto alchemist who was in the chat. A uh, big thank you for all of MH370X. All the followers have been following and supporting this whole time. Uh, we learned a lot more today. We can understand and explain the videos better than we could yesterday. So every day that we improve our knowledge is a day where we've gotten smarter, a day where we've gotten closer to the truth, and one day we will expose that entire truth to the world. Thank you, everybody. Peace.